girl, I proposed that we introduce also a different format for our seminars. Instead of having seminars where results that have been obtained are announced, I propose that we also allow people to say what are their plans and how do these plans fit into a somewhat more general background. Results which would be updated. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, the title of this <laughs> seminar is Project <laughs> Number 55, and that uh, allows some questions what does it mean. It's simply an internal numbering of projects at the Center for Theoretical Physics. And the grant that has number 55 is entitled Determination of Geometry from Scattering Data. Now I will start with the background. The background goes way back. We have the first name here, Niels, not Bohr, but Niels Abel, 1826. So it really goes very deep. What Abel did? He was the first, he died, very young. He died at the age of 27, but he accomplished a lot during his short life. In particular, I will mention one of his contributions. So this uh, the guy from Abelian. Yes. Yes, Abelian. Abelian group. The same guy and elliptic functions, integral equations, and a lot more. I wish that Okay. So why do I start with Apple? Because derived a formula which is called now Abel transform. Has anybody seen the Abel transform here in the audience? Yeah, I saw no. once. Yes. I saw, but very good. I never I used very much. Uh, Consciously, I never use it. <laughs> As you know, transforms have different forms. We have Fourier transform, you have Hankel transform, and there is also a Laplace transform. Transform in general means that there is a dual relationship between two functions and that this relationship can be inverted. And the Abel transform is concerned with the following problem. We have some function f of r and this is in two dimensions, so maybe I should even call it f of rho, not to confuse it with three dimensions. So this function has this shape. And now we cut this shape with a straight line, and we integrate. So you mean it depends on the on the right, this right? function. Function is a function of rho. So what all sets are circles? It's color function. Yes, it's a function which is spherically symmetric or cylindrically symmetric in two dimensions. <laughs> and we define the following new function, which can be called f, can be called the Abel transform, which is a function of y. And it is given by the integral from minus infinity to infinity. And here is the since this is symmetric this under is rotations, I can just choose horizontal lines only. Later, this will be generalized. And here is this function f of rho. And the rho is, of course, the square root of x squared plus y squared. And we integrate it over x, and we get a function of y. The question that Abel posed and answered is, knowing f of y, can we determine little f of rho? And this is the basis. This is a little bit uh, asymmetric because rho is a priori positive, whereas yes. y, so do we 
can we assume from the very beginning that f, f is uh, which symmetric f? on Yes, yeah, of I course. Know. It will be obvious if so, the definition. Yeah. Because it's a function of y squared. Mm -hmm. So these are symmetric uh, uh, even functions of Yes. And the question is, given f of y, how do we determine f? And this is basis of computed tomography or CAT or whatever. There. This was the first case where the problem of computed tomography, which is now probably number one in medical diagnostics. But then you should mention Stefan Kach. Well, but this is 26. 26. Because, because, well, the, I will mention is, other names also. Don't this worry. is a transform, but I mean, to get the computer tomography picture, you don't need to do this. I will mention uh, computerized uh, tomography uh, also. Three dimensional version. Okay, so, so to the the now let me, since, not since, the, the, since the, the, these talks uh, should also include some pedagogical ingredient, I will give this pedagogical ingredient because I think it's quite interesting. So how does one proceed? How did Adel do it? Well, we change the variable from x to rho. And rho, of course, is square root of x squared plus y squared. And therefore, when we convert from x, we get this differential formula, dx equals d rho over rho times x, and x is equal, obviously, square root of rho squared minus y squared. And since, as was already mentioned by Professor Kioski, this is symmetric, I can write this as twice an integral now over rho, and rho cannot be bigger than y, so it starts from y to infinity, d rho, and here we have our function f, little f of rho, which is multiplied by what I get from here, which is... Uh, um, should it be uh, uh, inverse in this? Um, it is first from R for the, the x. I mean, x should be in the curve. dx, well, I take the differential of yeah. this, it's okay. and I get rho in the denominator, x one. Oh, times x. One half. No. No, no because no. there's a square there. So. so d rho over. That is this famous project. <laughs> Rho times rho squared and y squared. And now I can do the following. This is the formula. OK. So now what I do. I differentiate yeah. the respect of y, df over dy on the left hand side. When I differentiate, I get the minus sign here, integral from y to infinity, 0 over rho. Now this gets into the denominator, and the factor of y appears because of the differentiation, and here we have the square root in the denominator. Plus. There's no plus here, because when I differentiate with respect to y, I get y uh, or rho at the point of y, which is 0. And there is no contribution from infinity, because the function is supposed to be vanishing at infinity. Now. Uh, what Abel did next, I will just skip these steps. Uh, he just noticed that if one calculates the following object, 1 over pi 
integral from rho to h, yeah, to infinity, yes, the same pi that we know from high school. Different. If this is y, df over d y, 1 over y squared minus rho squared square root. Yes, so the representative of a pedagogical competition of the Polish Academy of Science publicly stated that the knowledge of number p is tough, is, is not really necessary for a Polish student. Uh, particular fact. So when one substitutes now this into here, one gets a double integral, and the double integral is one from here and the other from here, and the result which I have here is the following, minus 2 divided by pi, and the integral from rho to infinity, this is one integral, dy times y divided by y squared minus rho squared, and the other integral, y to infinity, the, let me know, since this is a function of rho, I have to use a different integration variable, rho 1, say, integral from rho, rho 1 squared minus y squared f prime of rho 1, and the integration is over y and rho 1, so let me call this axis y, and this is rho 1, and the limits are such that first you see that y must be bigger than rho, therefore this is the allowed region, y is bigger than rho, and y, uh, rho 1 is bigger than, I'm sorry, This is row one and not row. Yeah. I see. Them. Here is row, so this must be bigger than row. Yeah. And also row one here must be bigger than y. So this is the allowed. This is the allowed. No, no, the other no, the other one. One. no. Here is this region, so the integration over y is restricted, it lies between rho and rho 1, therefore this formula can be written in the following form, 2 over pi, and there is first the integral over y from rho to rho 1 of these denominators, so let me write it this way, and people who have seen elliptic functions know that this integral can be expressed in terms of elliptic functions, and this is why Abel was able to do this integral, because he was one of the people who studied elliptic functions. And there is the second part here, which involves integration over rho 1 from f prime of rho 1, and the integral is from rho Infinity. Now this this is uh, a very capital F. No, 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 F prime. Ah, ah, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <coughs> uh, okay. <coughs> so now we have this formula. This would seem to depend on this is a very neat integral, it should be used as an exercise in calculus 1. Namely, seemingly this integral depends on rho, rho 1, but it does not. One can first notice that this function is homogeneous, I'm sorry, this factor of y, of course. Homogeneous, <coughs> this is of the order of y squared, and there's y squared in the numerator, therefore it does not depend on the scale, and it turns out that this integral here, no matter what rho and rho 1 are, is equal to pi. 
Therefore, pi and pi cancel. We have minus 2 here. And this, of course, is a complete derivative. Minus. So this is minus f of rho. And this is the famous other formula. f of rho is equal to minus 1 over pi integral from rho to infinity dy df over dy divided by the square root of y squared minus rho squared. We were able to invert this relationship and therefore if you send an x-ray here and this x-ray is absorbed by the tissue here whose distribution, density distribution is given by this function, we can recover the distribution of the tissue by measuring the intensity here. The only question is that the picture is not silly because it's like... Yes, I know. That is why I have now... This was the deep history. Now we move on. And from Abel, we move to Radon, Johann Radon, an Austrian mathematician. In 1917, generalized this not only to allow functions which are not symmetric under rotation, but also he generalized this to three dimensions and in general to n dimensions. And the Radon transform Position of this 
line without changing its inclination. So this is the famous Radon transform. And of course, this is the whole field of science. There are books that are called the Radon transform. This is not the only one. And this is the basis of computed tomography and Adam Corman and Godfrey Housefield Housefield obtained the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1979 for computer tomography. And that was the so-called transmission tomography. There is also emission tomography. And an example of emission tomography is positron emission tomography, etc., etc., etc. And that is about the deep background. Now we but, move. But, but again, I have to underline because if you read the the only reason I know is that I just wrote a story about the Kashmir. <laughs> so I know this exactly. In the Nobel lecture, yes. the student, the Cormac, who is a mathematician, the other fellow was an engineer who built it, he mentioned explicitly that the only way how this whole thing works is because of the Kashmir algorithm. Because it's not this integral which is relevant. You get enormous number. Yes, yes. You get the linear equations and the the fast way of solving this I agree. It's, it's not this, this integral is in, it, it's, 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 so, yeah, no, it's, it's a little ingredient how you collect the points. Yes. But it, this problem but, uh, but when you said that this is why the computer tomography works. It would never work on this. Yes. It, it this, works on a different principle. This is the other side of the story. Mathematics is simple, but applications are very complicated because, mathematically speaking, this is an ill-posed mathematical problem. And yes. it, an ill-posed mathematical problem means that if you make a small error, that does not necessarily mean that you get a small result. And therefore, there is a whole science how to apply this when you have discrete set of data, and you always have only a discrete set of data. <coughs> And there are many algorithms, there are conferences devoted to this subject, how to explore this data. And of course, uh, when you do it in one plane, that is not enough because you want to scan your brain, say, at different planes. And this is the so-called uh, helical uh, tomograph that scans in this way so it covers slice and slice and slice of brain or any other tissue. Of course, medical applications are not the only ones. There are many applications in astrophysics to study the distribution of matter. There are many applications in oil industry to study the oil deposits and to study the materials, the cracks in materials, etc. Uh, so it is, of course, as I said, the whole science. But now I have to move on somewhere. There must be room for this subject, which is contained in my proposal to determine geometry. So now we move with geometry and the person which, who should be mentioned here is Howard E. 1936. He wrote a very short, not even two pages, article for science. And he's very apologetic. At the beginning of this article, he says, some time ago, I made this little calculation. and." It, he mentions one of the editors of science. They insisted that I publish it. So here it is. Here is my publication. And the title of this paper of Einstein was Lens-like action of a star by the deviation of light in the gravitational field. 
So the idea was quite simple, but uh, and that is why Einstein thought that this is maybe not even worth publishing, but it of course had very profound consequences. Here is a distant object, like maybe quasar or whatever. Here is some massive star, and here is the observer that looks at the star, and of course the rays are bent due to the massive object here in the middle. So what the observer will see is not the original object, but this is like in the lens. He will see a ring. If, if, the, if everything is aligned, then the observation will see a ring instead of seeing just a point source. If this is displaced, there is some offset, then this ring is distorted. And this is the subject of this paper by Einstein. He calculated the size of this ring depending on the masses and the distances. And he said that this is impossible to measure because we don't have instruments that would have such a resolution. <laughs> Later, of course, the technology developed so these things are measured. Teraz mamy instrument, mianowicie internet, który może wszystko, tak? And the next person who should be mentioned here is our famous astrophysicist Bogdan Paczyński, <coughs> who 50 years later proposed the whole program to study dark matter using microlensing, using an idea which also is mentioned in Einstein's paper, namely, even if we don't see the rain because we don't have enough resolution, we can still see the changes in brightness of this object when this massive star passes through and Einstein calculated this change of, in brightness and the change in brightness is even singular, it becomes infinite if the source is a point-like source. Of course, for sources which are not point-like, there is no infinity here, but still we have this enhancement of brightness and this is how Paczynski's program started and it is still going on with the participation of Polish astronomers. They are looking for various massive objects that would change the geometry. And this is where the connection with my proposal is, because what this lensing is about is that by seeing what comes to us, we determine the geometry. The geometry here is that according to Einstein, the geometry is changed by the distribution of masses. So, now I will be a little bit more technical, just to explain what I mean. One may say that, well, Einstein did it, what else can we do? Well, this is just a very rough measure of geometry. Geometry, in general, is measured by something more detailed, namely by the metric tensor. And the question is, can we determine the metric tensor from such observations? The metric tensor of geometry which is between the source and the observer. And the best way to see how to do it is to use the complex form of Maxwell equation which I advocated here many times, if one introduces what I call the riemann zilberstein vector, which has two pieces, B plus RB. Then Maxwell equations become one complex equation, IG F equals curl of F in flat space, in Nikoski space. The question is, how do these equations change when we have distortion of geometry?
shift from Minkowski to something more complicated. And one can work out the formula. Here one can use the contribution of Jerzy Plewański, who was the first to notice that geometry acts as a medium of some kind in Maxwell equations. And the Maxwell equations can be still written in a similar form. Namely, it's a curl of G. And G depends on F through the constitutional equations. Constitutive equations determine the relation between F and G. But it, isn't that just going over to the four dimensions from what is being done in the laboratories of uh, engineers and it's called ellipsometry? You take a piece, yes. piece of material, shine the light on it. Absolutely. And yes. You measure the deformation of the light looking at what happens to the passing light. Yes. And the geometry, the, the, the deformation that, tensor is just a metric tensor uh, uh, of the elastic that, medium, but it's just in three dimensions. Except that this is in four dimensions. Yeah, so that's. So, what is, is, so we're talking, exactly. ellip we're talking exactly. ellipsometry in four dimensions. Yes, and the formula is the following one. We have one over G, not, not this is the upper tensor, and then here we have uh, Gij divided by the square root of minus G minus I epsilon I J K G zero K. So all components of the metric tensor enter here, and here we have F uh, sorry, G Fraction index or uh, refraction yeah. index. Yes, sure, sure. The relate in, in in standard Maxwell theory, G vector is made of E plus I H yeah. and F is made of G as I have written plus I B. Therefore the relation between G and F is the met is mu or what it is epsilon and mu, right? Yes, right. But these are just vacuum Maxwell equations written in 3 plus 1 decomposition. However, however, yes, <coughs> there is a however here. However, here is that if one does it with normal media, like a piece of dielectric, for example, then we cannot write an equation in terms of F alone, because the dielectric acts differently on the electric field and on the magnetic field. It does not affect the magnetic properties. It only affects the electric properties. Therefore, we cannot write the relation between F and G without splitting first G and F into real and imaginary part. However, gravity is different. Gravity is an interesting medium. It allows us to write the equation still in this form without splitting F and G into the real and imaginary part. This also has further consequences and... But, but of course the very notion of F relies on 3 plus 1 decomposition. Sir. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Just one more question. Does the rotation and V over T here mean... Uh, it means geometric. Core geometric Yes. Rotation. Yeah. On the, the three Riemannian manifold. So, so this is the rotation we used to, where you used the covariant derivative. Yes. No, no this are not covariant derivatives. They are normal More derivatives. Than derivatives. Normal derivatives. That's it. They are covariant because, yeah. okay. No, okay. because these objects in fact yes. are densities. Yes, Everything yes, is yes. covariant with the I agree that it is covariant, but these are not covariant derivatives. One does not need to introduce the crystal symbol. In that sense. Because you introduce G. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes if you translate you the vector yeah, but, that's, density, but that's the whole trick to figure, to, to write it the way that. You so, know, what is this? 
subject of the Christopher symbols. What is the subject of this project 55 that has been generous, generously supported by National <laughs> Science Council? Uh, the, the subject is to see how much geometry we can determine from scattering data. Now, what is scattering data in this context? We have incoming radiation here. There is some distortion of geometry here in the middle. And we have outgoing radiation. And the time flows upwards. And the question is, by looking at the relationship between in and out radiation, can we determine the metric here? Now one can clearly see that there is one piece that cannot be determined, because this object here does not depend on conformal rescaling. If I change the metric from g mu nu to phi of x and g mu nu, if I multiply all components by a scalar function of space-time, then this function just disappears Excuse here me. because it's all. If, if, if I have the uh, electromagnetic wave which goes, it's free somewhere, and then comes to um, yes. my cup and it goes away. Mm -hmm. Now I know that I can manufacture the cup out of the material, whereas the outgoing waves will be not distorted by this object if this is a metamaterial. Yes, but uh, can we, uh, we, which means that I have to build up this cup from a material with a funny refraction index. Yes. Let's, let's, let's pay, say it this way. Can, is it conceivable that I can well, construct such a metric tensor yes, there is uh, one for one which there will yes, be no already meta, yes, meta gravity? Yes, already I gave an example. Because if you take Minkowski metric, and then you multiply this Minkowski metric by like distorting it by a conformal factor, you will not see any scattering at all. I will not scattering, but then, but then this that, new metric tensor will not be the solution of Einstein equation, or will be? I, the, the no, the will, no, 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 wait, because a metamaterial is something which I can here, buy in no, the no, store. Here the metric is I'm talking about the physics. I'm trying to understand I'm talking the physics. about the physics too. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. But let me, so let me rephrase my question. If I made up two cup, identical cups in a shape, one which is made out of a clay and the other is made out of a metamaterial, Right? And I shine the same light. Then in one case I see some shadow, and out of that shadow I will generalize shadow. I see some outgoing radiation out of which yes. I can calculate the geometry of that cup precisely. And the other, if this is metamaterials, I will not be able to then do this so. This is what I said. Now, I... No, no, but the cup was made up by myself. Now, if I have the gravitation tensor, the, the metric tensor G mu, nu, then it should be, to make it, requires to have a mass to curve the space in a proper way. So the, so the question is that in addition of writing the metric tensor as a function phi times the Minkowski tensor, I always have to think about the Einstein equations which related the, yes. the matter distribution to this metric tensor. Yeah, sure. And my question, and this is what I call making the cup, right? Yeah. Yeah, out of clay. And yeah. this is a, so can I make the metric tensor G mu nu equal to phi times uh, Minkowski by solving a new uh, you, don't, you don't need to solve anything. You just calculate the uh, G mu nu. No, I'm just asking part. It no. cannot be vacuum because if the I'm just yeah. asking from where this I uh, this I perfectly understand. The question is: Is the tensor G is there any matter distribution, yes, real yes, matter yes. distribution, uh, which will generate? Yes, this is what I was answering. Uh, that I don't, you that can't. I miss. You take this tensor, yes. you calculate G mu nu, and you say that uh, this is my uh, this way. momentum tensor. But you cannot. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but. It, uh, what kind of distribution would be the 
out on the of the fight. The only thing which differs this theory with little Jimmy New equal five times eta from is the field fight. This is not a very no no no. no. So it does not exist because uh, 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 at least a uh, <coughs> uh, uh, traditional theory where Lagrange is of the first order of the of first essential order of phi, then T mu nu depends upon the first derivatives of phi. And <coughs> Here it yeah, but this curvature is, uh, depends upon second derivatives. Therefore, a priori it doesn't work. But maybe there is some more general framework, but, but it is even difficult to, that is to not state what that. I, that is the not question. what I am interested in. You wanted me to uh, no, comment. No, no, no. You I wanted to comment on metamaterials. I said there is a very trivial example, and I gave this example where we have some analogy with metamaterials. But that's all. What I am interested in is uh, geometry, which is yeah, but the produced by the real matter. Was not to say that there are ma ma uh, objects with the negative refraction index, because that was known for since many years. But to manufacture. Them. But, uh, to get the real physical system which has this problem. It's better to change Einstein equations to conformal invariant equations like Bach equations. Bach equations are Saturday. What what kind of equations? Bach equations. Bach? Bach. Like Jan Sebastian Bach. I don't know anything about Okay, so there is there is some tense kind of force can we go down to my level. Just one 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 sentence. There is a tensor which is symmetric second rank tensor, but it is of fourth order in the metric. And if, some, if, if, if a manifold is conformal to Einstein, this back tensor is zero. Uh -huh. Okay? And this back tensor is conformal to invariant guy, okay? and this back in 1920 something generalized Einstein equation to conformal to invariant equation that was just B mu nu equals to T mu nu. And if B mu nu is back tensor, which is conformal to invariant, Equations are invariant, in particular, Schwarzschild solution is a solution of Bach equations. So, and I, now you can just discuss it. it and then, 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 then the problem is solved. And, and yeah, well, let me take it. Einstein, Einstein theory is not conformal. Of course not. Yeah, but it's very difficult. I mean, conformal invariance is a scale invariance yeah. in the normal yeah. language. It's pretty difficult to introduce a mass distribution which is scale invariant. Yeah. No, and therefore, no. This, uh, I don't. Well, no. I'm sorry. I said no because in three dimensions it's extremely trivial, and uh, to construct the matter which is conformal invariant, which is scale invariant, no. is trivial. No. You you have lots of the you have the the even your, this. Uh, Kepler, but not the Kepler, but the Could we continue Ptolemy and bodies, which are scale invariant, like icosahedra, and they, 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 this is a matter of distribution. I can Could build I them continue up. with the main subject? Yeah, okay. The main subject is to study some interesting geometry, not the geometry which I was forced to name, answering the question: Is the metamaterial? gravity in this context. Yes, there is, but this is not an interesting question because, as was stressed here, it is very unusual to have such a metric. But which if it will exist, it will not be observable, but it will still contribute to the, wait, to wait. the energy of the universe. No, it will be observable because there are other observations. For example, instead of photons, you can send massive particles, and that will fuel the scale. So this is not something that is unobservable. But not in the optical observation. Not the optical, because no, also as far as I know, we are not doing the particle beam astronomy. Of course, we are doing all the time. In addition to photon astronomy, we are doing particle astronomy. Cosmic rays yes. are coming to. Yeah, but we don't. Uh, what we do we do study do? cosmic rays for other reasons, not for the micro lenses. We study them. We don't know from where they are coming. In some cases, we do. Yes. Yeah, okay, let, let us okay. continue in the direction of this. So, this is a We are not knowing from where the project is. No. How you again are sidetracked from the main topic, subject? The main subject is that's now. That's the beauty of the this. Okay. Like this, uh, so we. But it's fine. We have I, a nice I, would, seminar. I would like to uh, come to some uh, point which uh, is the. 
essential subject because I was talking about the scattering data. So how does one connect this description with scattering data? Of course, scattering data are most commonly described in terms of the S matrix or the S operator. And how does this come about? Well, we have the outgoing field, let's say F out. And this is connected with the incoming field by the S matrix. And this connection now is what I would say the essence. The, the this gives me the scattering data. And the question is, what can I say knowing the connection with gravity of this form about S matrix? S -matrix. The first question, which is very important, which we have to answer, is whether the S matrix does not feel just a trivial change in the metric, namely the change in the metric, which is due to coordinate changes. This is something which should not be seen, because changing coordinates do not change the geometry. It's just a different way of describing geometry. And this question, fortunately, can be quite generally answered. And this can be answered by analogy with gauge invariance. Change of the coordinate system is like a gauge in electromagnetism. In the electromagnetic case, we have just one scalar function, lambda, say, which determines the change of gauge. Whereas when we change the coordinate system, we have three functions which tell me how the coordinates change each one of them. So I will just mention how does the invariance under gauge transformations work and then one can easily see that this can be extended to coordinate changes. Namely when we have the S matrix, then you may Recall that this is something which has a, in the exponent the coupling between the electromagnetic field and the curve here. So if I ask for a change in the S matrix, which is due to a change in A mu, say an infinitesimal change of A mu, of this form, then I get the current. And because of this derivative, I get the divergence of the current and S. Therefore, due to the current conservation, there is no change in the S matrix, which is the physical requirement, due to the change of the gauge of the electromagnetic field. And the same works for the gravitational case, instead of J mu A mu, I have a coupling which involves the metric tensor and the energy momentum tensor. Therefore, when I change coordinates in G mu nu, then G mu nu goes into G mu nu plus the symmetrized derivative of this function psi mu, and therefore the energy yes. momentum conservation. Infinitesimal change, absolutely. Li derivative. Li derivative. Correct. Then infinitesimal change in G mu nu can be shown to not to contribute because of the energy momentum conservation. So the first question is answered in positive. This uh, construction will not be sensitive to changes in the coordinate system. So how does one proceed then? It, what is the first step here? Of course, the problem is rather complicated because you can see that if I have an arbitrary gravitational field here, then solving the Maxwell equation in this case is just impossible. So I can pros cannot proceed directly. There should be some approximation method and the first thing that comes into one's mind is to use the Born approximation that is to consider weak scattering not 
exact, but weak scattering. And what do we have then? We have F out on the left hand side. And F out is a solution of free Maxwell equations in flat space, because I am assuming that my distortion of geometry happens only here, not when I make the observation and not when the radiation comes in. Therefore, F out can be written down as a Fourier integral. And here is again something which is rather useful in these calculations. This is three halves here. There is a polarization vector U of k. And then we have two terms here. The amplitude A out, say, and the same, of course, for in, whether it's in or out. It's the same formula, except that these amplitudes are different. Now you can use the quantum field theoretic interpretation, in which case these are annihilation operators. Or you may just say that I have a classical electromagnetic field. Since the equations are linear, there's no difference between operators and ordinary functions. And here we have, we have e to the minus omega t plus i k dot r. And there is a second term here, which involves the amplitudes for the opposite circular polarization. Again, out or in of k e to the i omega t minus i k r. What is nice about this decomposition is that I can study left-handed and right-handed photons one at a time. I don't have to consider arbitrary polarization, which makes life much simpler because I'm dealing with one scalar function, not with vector functions that also contain information about polarization. And that is a simplification, which tells me that the scattering, that there is no information about polarization because polarization, certainly polarization does not change in gravitational field. And that again is due to the, ah, of course, one very important assumption which I failed to mention. Namely, I assume that my geometry is stationary. Therefore, there is no creation of radiation. I only have scattering. If this is non-stationary, if there is time dependence in the tensor, then I produce radiation and it becomes really much more complicated. I'm studying now geometry which is stationary. It does not have to be static. Of course, it can have this piece here, but it must be stationary. And what does it mean that it's stationary? It means that there will be no mixing between this part and this part, because this has opposite sides in frequency, and stationary metric cannot flip the frequency. It's like the energy conservation, of course. Stationary metric. Splitting into positive and negative frequencies is absent. Yes. It does not depend. Well, so. That's right. Yeah, but still, still the geometry should be allowed to vary in time, but in a sufficiently slow way. Oh yes, that is I, I, I mean a, a planet uh, circulating around the star, which is the essence of micro-lensing micro -lensing effect on, 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 on the light curve of a distant object, should be included, because otherwise you lose the most important physical uh, so application. Is another, yeah, but probably yes. it can also be taken. Well, uh, still a planet produces radiation. And this is the effect we studied. The yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, very small, but it, uh, probably it doesn't relevant for in this. No, it's process. not relevant in this context. One can assume that omega is a very slowly varying function of yeah. time also. So now, uh, when I compare my how does one compare outgoing and incoming fields? To make this comparison, since we don't know the S matrix, the best way to proceed is just to solve the Maxwell equation. 
because the Maxwell equation, I'm slowly getting to the end, the, the Maxwell equations written here are conveniently written in a somewhat different form. I bring to the left here, of, I put C equals 1, but there should be a factor of C. If one wants to. C is equal to 1. C is equal to 1. I split my formula here into two parts, the free part, so to speak, which is the one that is valid in that space, and some contribution which is different. Which so this, this means that you take the linear the approximation of the field, and I believe this is very... Yes, yeah, sure. Sure, sure, exactly. No. You may even uh, assume that uh, the Einstein equations are fulfilled in linear approximation. Yes, uh, so there will be some matrix here which remains here after subtracting the free part times f. So this is my equation now here where I split. There's no approximation yet, just uh, split of this formula into two parts, the free part, so to speak, and the interaction part. And now when I solve this by using the appropriate Green function, I obtain the formula for F of RT state, which is equal to F incoming of RT, which is the free solution of Maxwell equations, plus the contribution, which contains this object and the appropriate green function, which is nothing else but the retarded green function here, well known for the wave equation, and the integration is over some x prime, and here we have this matrix gamma times f, and of course one would have to solve this integral equation, which again is in general impossible. However, when I do the Born approximation, that means that I replace f by incoming field, and I only started the linear contribution. Then from here, I can obtain the outgoing field if I take this t to plus infinity, and then this delta function, which is a solution of the inhomogeneous equation, becomes the solution of the homogeneous equation, the famous pauli jordan function, d of x is equal to i d 3 k divided by 2 pi q 2 k, and there are two terms, e to the minus i omega t plus i k r minus complex conjugate, this is the solution of free Dynamper equation. And I have now the formula that connects out and in. This is scattering data. If I substitute some incoming field, I can write down immediately the outgoing field. And it will depend on Fourier transforms of this metric distribution. So now I have a formula as a first step and I can now substitute and invert the Fourier transformation, but of course that would not be enough yet to say that I've completed the project. This is just a rough first step to show that something for weak scattering can be done which leads to an explicit formula that gives me the Yes. Yes, exactly. And that is all I wanted to say. That this, of course, is just the first step. And one should do something better to. Nawet jeżeli są pozbawione większego sensu.
sensu, ale <laughs> że konsekwencji nie ma z tym So the main, again, the main. Ah, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. The main aim, which still remains to be fulfilled, but the project started a few months ago, will be to do something better than just the Born approximation. In other words, to find the radon transform here, which will enable one to determine the metric from the test matrix. I, uh, well, I have to say something which probably is again, but I mean, there is a branch of physics which is called the pattern recognition. Yes, and the image yeah. or image image recognition. There is even a journal devoted to this journal, and even we have a distinguished representative of our fraternity who used to work on these topics. Uh, uh, on support. I mean, they they look up at the problem whether you can shine the light through the fog. Yes, absolutely. No, I, I mean, this is, the, the subject is so wide that so, uh, it would so, so this be is, uh, even this to is name kind of the, image recognition the of topics. the image of recognition. gravitation field from incoming to us electromagnetic radiation. But what is really done, which is practical in astrophysics, is to use the ray, simple ray pictures. Yes. Not yeah, I mean, I, I, I was showing you, I have an application for exoplanet which clearly shows this. Okay, just a few general remarks. Um, so first remark, uh, how many functions do you expect to recover from your team, from your team? So the metric, the metric in principle has 10 independent components. Uh, but if you look at the gauge transformation, it gives you only two. So the transformations at the end of the day give you two functions at, the, at every point. A very good question. I don't know the answer. So the answer is that there are two for each point. So it, it is possible to invert this, this relation. That it should give you two, two functions for each point. I have a comment. Not answer, but a comment. General relativity. I believe that the uh, correct framework for this is just a linear gravity linearization of gravity, because then everything is well defined, the gauge transformation are well defined, and uh, there are two degrees of freedom. Therefore, if you uh, recover two degrees of freedom, you recover everything modulo gauge. Yes. I agree. However, that is... Uh, no. this, this however, is I would not agree... I would not agree that linear gravity, because linear gravity is roughly the born approximation. It is not very okay. profound. Can I have another remark? Absolutely. So the way you write it down is depends very much on the choice of the coordinates. Yes. So perhaps it would be better to write this everything in a completely coordinate invariant manner just to get rid of things which obscure the picture. Um, Yes, but because it is gauge invariant, then I am sure there is a way to rewrite it in a gauge invariant way. If you could write the equation you have written down in a coordinate, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't know how to do it. Uh, we, we might discuss it. I agree that that would be very nice to have a completely geometric. So I, I, I'd be glad to talk about that. And one final remark, if anybody does not know how the radon transform work, you can think uh, about the simple problem, how to reduce the general problem of radon transform to the needs to the other transform. There is a very simple trick here, and it's so ingenious that you should first think about yourself, how, how to reduce the general problem of radon transform to the other transform. And if you try to figure out, just check how the radon transform works. This As so one, one dimension. And assume the function which no, does not depend upon the, the other dimension. The radon transform uh, can be very easily understood in terms of Fourier transformation. <coughs> That's one possibility, yeah. but there is another. You can reduce the problem of radon transform to the other transform. Why should I say that? Okay. You take a given point and you tell us pass. sometime on the seminar. Yes. In okay, I'm okay. so we are not having this is, this is running out of time and okay. Okay. As you said, simple, that will require the decent.